reprendre nos discussions de l'après-midi. C'est vrai que c'est très haut, où je, où je suis très petite, mais c'est vrai que le, le pupitre est fait pour... Le, je ne suis pas assez grande le pupitre n'est pas assez grand. Ah, bon, ben on va faire avec alors. <rire> donc, on va accueillir cet après-midi deux intervenantes, donc Wendy Grossman et Maureen Murphy. Euh, la première intervention sera en anglais, si je ne me trompe pas. Euh, le titre est Unmasking Adrienne Fidlin, Pablo Picasso, Manre Andy. Invisibility, ou en tout cas in entre parenthèses, j'aime bien les, les parenthèses dans les titres, mais donc visibilité, invisibilité, of racial difference. Et Wendy Grossman is a curatorial associate at the Phillips Collection in Washington, D.C., an adjunct faculty in the NYU Global Program in D.C. as well. She has lectured internationally on photographic history and early 20th century European and American modernism, curated exhibitions on these topics, and taught at various universities in the Washington DC metropolitan area and at Middlebury College, Middlebury, Vermont. Grossman is the author of numerous publications, including Man Ray, African Art, and The Modernist Lens, the award-winning catalog for the touring exhibition she curated that opened at the Philips Collection in October 2009. Et je vais vous lire également euh, la biographie de ma chère collègue Maureen Murphy, euh, qui est historienne de l'art, qui est euh, maîtresse de conférences à l'université euh, Paris 1 Sorbonne, ou Paris 1 Panthéon Sorbonne, euh, qui a publié euh, différents travaux sur la réception et la représentation des arts d'Afrique en Occident, et sur les liens entre ces derniers et l'art moderne, ainsi que sur, et elle n'a pas utilisé les parenthèses, mais les guillemets, que j'aime beaucoup aussi, l'art contemporain africain. Et sa présentation portera après celle de Wendy euh, sur ah, <rire> euh, s'intitule plus exactement inverser le regard la représentation des modèles noirs chez les peintres africains modèles voilà merci bienvenue à Wendy thank you all for coming this afternoon and particularly to the organizers of this Um, symposium and this event. Uh, I'm really honored to be here with all my esteemed colleagues. Um, and in particular, I want to give a shout out to Denise Morel for her amazing project that has um, opened a door for the scholarship and the revealing of this story. So thank you all and thank you all for coming. Pablo Picasso's 1937 painting, Femme Assise sur Fond Jean, et rose, numéro deux, is a mystery wrapped inside an enigma. Why is so little known about this intriguing painting by one of the 20th century's most scrutinized artists? Who was the portrait's model, and why did the artist represent her in its unusual way? And after being secreted away in Picasso's personal collection until the end of his life, Why is it so difficult to find its location today? While I am still unable to answer this last question, my talk will address these other queries about this exceptional portrait that you see here on the screen. Presenting my research, supporting the contention that the painting subject is the Guadalupe dancer and model, Adrien Pillem, I will then make a case for the significance of this new attribution. Picasso created this portrait while residing with Dora Maar and a varying circle of friends in the rustic hilltop village of Mougins in the south of France in the late summer and fall of 1937. This was an event copiously chronicled by several of its participants, including, as you can see here, um, by the British surrealist artist Roland Penrose and the American artist Man Ray. Maar, Lee Miller, and Nuchel Ward captured in these photographs, all served as models in well-known portraits Picasso created during this outing. In contrast, the portrait of the unnamed model, which you can see down here in the corner, um, has seed, of the unnamed, unnamed seated woman has eluded critical attention. 
This can, in part, be explained by the painting's absence in the catalog resume of Picasso's work and its having been virtually unknown prior to the reproduction in Douglas Duncan's uh, 1961 revelatory publication, Picasso's Picasso's. Without wide exposure and critical attention, the identity of the model and the artist's Africanizing lexicon have failed to attract the attention they merit. I encountered a reproduction of this painting in the course of researching the little known story of Adrien Fidelin, who was introduced into Picasso's circle by her romantic partner, Man Ray. Given her warm embrace by members of this intimate group gathered in Mojan, which was copiously documented in photographs by Man Ray and others, it seemed inevitable that this striking figure would have been among the women the Spanish artist chose to portray in this period. While my predisposition undoubtedly influenced my reading of the painting subject, both the racialized manner in which she was represented, that wasn't right, <laughs> uh, and its remarkable re resemblance to an analogous photograph by Man Ray made Fidela instantly recognizable to me as the subject. As I will argue here, not only Man Ray's photograph, but also the circumstances surrounding the creation of this painting and the visual evidence embedded in the work itself all lend credence to this new attribution. Unmasking, as it were, Fidelin as the subject in Picasso's portrait puts a name to the mysterious and mesmerizing face, spotlighting the individual whose story has been shrouded in anonymity for over three quarters of a century. While serving as vehicles for recovering Fidelin from obscurity, Picasso's painting and Man Ray's photograph provide a springboard for an investigation into issues of race, gender, representation, and difference in the construction of modernism brought to the fore in both artists' portrayals of this long eclipsed muse. Fidelin's life weaves together a powerful tale of colonialism, migration, and the long eclipsed stories of women of color in shaping transatlantic modernity. Born in 1915 in Pointe-à-Pietre into one of Guadeloupe's oldest Creole families, she immigrated to France in the wake of the catastrophic 1928 cyclone that devastated the Caribbean, killing thousands, including her mother. While the exact date of her arrival and her transatlantic crossing is unknown, she likely emigrated in 1931 after being orphaned by the death of her father. She arrived in France in one of the successive waves of emigres looking for a better life in the colonial metropole in the storm's aftermath, joining family members in Paris who had made the passage before her. Without documentation of the initial period of transition to her new home, we are left to imagine the traumatic experience of exile she was forced to endure as a young teenager that undoubtedly shaped the life upon which she was about to embark. That may have been tempered in part by the diasporic community that had rallied in support of the victims of the Caribbean disaster, organizing events such as the January 1929 Grand Gala documented here. The rapidly growing French Antillean community and the vibrant diasporic cultural scene that was changing the French social political landscape in the interwar period was the world into which Fidelin entered. Despite the dearth of details surrounding her first years in France, indeed much of her life story, we know from later accounts and recent research that her passionate pursuit of traditional Guadeloupe and dance led her to frequent dance halls and events such as the Ball Blomé. This locale, along with a number of other similar spots populating Jazz Age Paris, where, radical and, uh, where racial and sexual taboos were being transgressed, there were also magnets for members of the international avant-garde, like the Hungarian photographer Brassai and Man Ray. The temptation to imagine a scenario in which Filin and Man Ray meet in such a location notwithstanding, no documentation has surfaced to make this presumption anything more at this point than mere speculation. What we do know from Man Ray's recovered date books 
is that Finlay entered his life as early as December 1934, countering the prevailing assumption that the relationship began in 1936. A series of undated photographs of Fidelin in dance poses, perhaps products of one of her early modeling sessions in Man Ray's studio, set the stage for a body of close to 400 photographs, an array of drawings, prints, paintings, and short film in which she would serve as the artist's muse, as Man Ray's muse, during her last, his last five years in Paris before the onslaught of World War II. Man Ray was not alone in finding Fidelin a captivating subject. A series of portraits by the German artist Vols, two of which were likely displayed in one of the artist's exhibitions at prominent Paris galleries in 1937, suggest that her efforts in building her modeling career in Paris were beginning to materialize. Indeed, in September that same year, she appeared in a photograph by Man Ray in a two-page spread in Harper's Bazaar, prominently illustrating Paul Elward's essay, The Bouchango of Africa Sends His Hats to Paris. The reproduction of this photograph rendered Fidelin the first black model to be featured in a major American fashion magazine, defying the industry's intransigent color barrier. Sporting a Congolese headdress, outfitted with a tiger's tooth necklace and ivory bangle, and seductively posed, she is conjured as a fetishized African native. It was also during this period, on the tale of their holiday adventures together in Moujon, that Man Ray penned an essay to accompany a series of Picasso's novel photograms published in the Cahiers d'Art in 1937. Notably, Fidelin surfaces in a passage in this essay where her lover cryptically asks, quote, have you ever seen a live camera, one upon which Adrienne can confidently lean with all her weight and it will not move, end quote. Here, Man Ray is secretly nodding in a characteristically whimsical manner at a playful image of Picasso and Fidelin he took during their recent Oceanside outing. The apparent rapport between Fidelin and Picasso is further reflected in an anecdote by the British surrealist artist Eileen Agar, in which she recounted in her memoir, quote, apparently, when Addie first met Picasso, she went up to him, flung her arms around his neck, and said, I hear you are quite a good painter, end quote. <laughs> Given the historical circumstances and the amity between the Spanish artist and the model, it was practically inevitable that Picasso would choose to include this beauty in his body of portraits created during the 1937 gathering. And indications that a woman of color was the inspiration for femme assise, such as the distinctive rendering of the model's hair texture, the unusual manner in which her complexion is depicted, and the tonality of the torso beneath the colorful overlay make Fidelin the prime candidate for the model portrayed. Moreover, she was the only individual of color present at this assembly or, for that matter, apparently elsewhere in Picasso's milieu during this period. In view of the fact that Picasso's palette is most often seemingly arbitrary, or at least non-representational, the exercise of determining race in his abstracted portraits on the basis of paint color alone is admittedly problematic. However, the artist represented the subject in this painting in what can only be interpreted as a racialized manner, reflective of Fidelin's Creole cultural background and her café au lait complexion. This contrasts with the manner in which Picasso represented Dora Maar, Nush Alward, and Lee Miller in the portraits he also created during the 37th sojourn in Moujam, where he employed skin tones and physical characteristics that leave little doubt as to the race of the individual being portrayed. That Fidelin is in fact the model of Femme Assis is substantiated by the remarkable re resemblance of the painting to Man Ray's contemporary fo contemporaneous photograph of his lover holding a washboard. Picasso's composition closely mirrors Man Ray's, not only in the rendering of Fidelin's physical characteristics, but also in her frontal pose, the awkward positioning of her arms around the washboard, and the design of her earring. 
The bold links of her chain necklace seen in the photograph are echoed in the interlocking hoops suspended from the base of the triangular shape upon which her oversized head rests. Even the shadow-like rendering of Fidelon's body in Picasso's canvas corresponds with the cast shadow in Man Ray's image. <laughs> Two other shared elements, albeit transposed to alternate sides of the composition, are the incorporation of an architectural element in the background and the existence of an abstract green form evocative plant life hugging the picture frame. While Fidelin is, is truncated in the painting and shifted from a full length standing pose to a sitting position by the insertion of a chair frame, her resolute gaze is translated through Picasso's enhanced encasing of her eyes in colorful shapes. Even as the mimetic nature and indexicality of its, the representation is lost in the passage from photograph to painting, Didelin's presence remains indelibly fixed in Picasso's canvas. Two vintage prints of this composition and several other photographs by Man Ray from the 1937 gathering were, in fact, in Picasso's personal collection, now in the archives of the Musée Picasso. This strongly substantiates the connection between the representations of Fidelin. And the persuasiveness of this new attribution is further supported by my discovery of a signed, cropped version of this image in which Man Ray had inscribed ARR Picasso on the photographic frame. This annotation um, is presumably shorthand for Arrangement Picasso. While this annotation can be interpreted in a number of different ways, it strongly corroborates my proposition that Fillin is the subject of the canvas in question, translated into paint by Picasso in collaboration with Man Ray's photographic efforts. However intriguing this revelation is, what emerges as a result of this new attribution is of far greater significance than simply an exercise in enriching the already exhaustive biographical information on Picasso or adding yet another investigation into the many women who made up the extensive repertoire of his portraits. It raises provocative questions about the manner in which a model of color is represented in the work of one of the 20th century's most celebrated and influential artists. Identifying Fidelin as the sitter in Picasso's portrait draws attention to the fact that he chose to paint a living model of color, leaving us to ponder why this was such a rare event in the creative history of an artist so invested in African art. Moreover, it encourages us to consider how the historical context of the period, characterized by increasing racial polarization and discord over colonial policies, might have inflected Picasso's approach to this portrait. It is notable that Picasso chose to reprise his distinctive Africanizing lexicon from the first decades of the century in this rare instance of portraying a black model thereby embedding his encoded notions of racial difference. Overlaid African signifiers include the triangular form buttressing the imposing head, which recalls a reliquary figure from the Kota peoples of equatorial Africa, an object Picasso both collected and readily looked to for inspiration. Additionally, the colorful pattern of vertical and horizontal hash marks on Fidelon's face are reminiscent of the stylized visage of the model in the upper right-hand corner of his groundbreaking 1907 Demoiselle d'Avignon and other paintings from this so-called primitivizing period inspired by different African mask forms. In the painting, the opaque black paint shrouding the right hand of the facial composition functions similarly in a mask-like manner, simultaneously veiling the identity of the figure behind it and evoking African sculptural forms that had profoundly informed Picasso's modernist aesthetic. As apparent in Man Ray's companion photograph to Picasso's painting, the Spanish artist was not alone in exploiting Fidelin's race 
as a foil to evoke primitivist tropes of fetishized black female bodies made popular in the wake of the Josephine Baker craze. In Man Ray's photograph, a bare-breasted fiddlin shields her lower torso with a washboard in a manner that has been interpreted as simulating a grass skirt or even a shield. Like Picasso, Man Ray also conflated African forms with black bodies, evident in his series of so-called Moto Congo photographs from which the image featured in Harper's Bazaar was selected, and in his choice to juxtapose Fidelin with a West African Sanufo sculpture in another photograph. The exoticizing tropes manifest in Man Ray's photographs and Picasso's painting underscore how blackness became a universalized shorthand through which Fidelin's ethnicity, Guadalupean heritage, and personal identity were all subsumed under an undifferentiated and exoticized rubric of race and difference. They also illustrate the contradictory manner in which the black female body was folded into the modernist project as simultaneously ultra-modern and ultra-primitive, all objectified under a male colonial gaze. Yet, despite Fidelin's presence in Picasso's portrait, Man Ray's photographs, and in hundreds of other representations, she has remained largely invisible in narratives of the interwar period over three quarters of a century since she emerged on the scene. When I began investigating her story over two decades ago, while uh, researching Man Ray's engagement with African art, virtually nothing was known about her beyond a few iconic photographs from the surrealist movement in which she remains frozen in time in her role as exotic muse. However, even in these publications in which these photographs have been featured, virtually nothing about her surfaces in the accompanying texts. The apparent lack of interest in further exploring Fidelin's story exemplifies the kind of intellectual myopia in conventional art history that is being challenged by the Musée d'Orsay's exhibition. And as Denise Morel says in her catalog essay, Imposing Modernity, the groundbreaking exhibition that helped generate the current one, she pointedly notes that, quote, in the absence of narratives that animate viewer curiosity and interest, black figures become invisible even while in plain view. Indeed, Picasso's painting to fiddle portrait for Picasso's okay. Sorry. Indeed, absent any reliable narrative connecting individuals portrayed in these photographs or Picasso's paintings, she nothing connects them to Fidelin's own story. She remained hidden in plain sight hyper-visible in works such as this, yet invisible in the histories of the period. Further obfuscating the historical record is the fact that in the occasional references to Fidelin that do exist, it is often erroneously reported that she hailed from Haiti, Martinique, or even the Philippines. Particularly egregious is the frequent mistaken identity of the woman posing alongside an imposing Cameroonian Bangwa Queen sculpture in an iconic photograph by Man Ray. Conflating Fidelin with another Guadalupean dancer Man Ray photographed a few years earlier, this misattribution reduces Fidelin's identity to a racial signifier and points to the yet to be recovered story of yet another unnamed black model. Like the majority of models whose stories are emerging in conjunction with this exhibition and the efforts of its curators, Fidelin has, until now, remained a footnote <coughs> at best. However, her importance and presence in an elite circle of the international avant-garde is increasingly gaining recognition, spearheaded by collaborative efforts between myself, Sala Patterson, and Jean-Pierre Teto. Consultation with genealogical sources in Guadeloupe has ascertained her birth and death dates for the first time, established her family tree. Scrutiny of Fidelin's correspondence with Man Ray after he was forced to flee Paris in 1940 has yielded insight into her frame of mind during this time and given us a hint of her own voice in narrating her story. 
What we know now is that Finlay waited faithfully for her lover's return after the war, only to be met with disappointment. Man Ray married during their years of separation and moved on with his life. He visited Paris in 1947 with his new wife, Juliette Man Ray, securing works that had survived the war with Fidelin's help and doing reconnaissance for his eventual return in 1951. Apparently resigned to the situation, Fidelin good-naturedly sat for a portrait with Juliette and her own new suitor, André Art, whom she subsequently married. They eventually moved to the small French town of Albi in the south, where she lived a modest life in public housing until she died in obscurity in 2004. She was thus alive in 1998 when Man Ray's assistant, Lucien Triard, erroneously asserted that Fidelin was no longer living. He made this statement in an interview undertaken in conjunction with a major international exhibition of Man Ray's photographs organized by the Centre Pompidou, and thus inadvertently further negated her relevance in this artist's story. Consequently, even as interest in Man Ray's artistic career experienced a resurgence in the last decades of the 20th century, no effort was made to seek out this vibrant muse and companion who was at his side for an important chapter in his life. As we engage in the process of putting together the pieces of the puzzle that was Fidelin's life, recovering portions of her lost story through such vehicles as identifying her portrait by Picasso serves to encourage further interest in and investigation into Fidelin's thus far overlooked life. Moreover, this discovery helps shift the narrative about the artist's engagement with his African and African diasporic sources from formalist concerns to more complex issues situated within the context of colonial discourse and racial discord in the interwar period. Indeed, this portrait challenges conventional notions that limit the importance of African influences in Picasso's work to the first decade of the century, a perception that has obscured subsequently created works, such as this. Contrary to this perception, as Christopher Green elucidates, the decade of the 1930s, in fact, commenced an important new chapter in the artist's engagements with Africa, one stimulated by his friendship with Michel Loris and association with the dissident surrealist faction spearheaded by George Bataille. Foregrounding the influence on Picasso of Loris's elevation of black culture, or l'art neg, as superior to white civilization, Green creates a new paradigm that argues for a more nuanced evaluation of Picasso's engagement with black culture than allotted for in the largely binary positions about the artists that currently prevail. Within this framework, Femme Assis might fruitfully be examined for the ways in which it opens up questions about racial dynamics within Picasso's milieu. Additionally, Situating as a companion to Picasso's Femme Assise, to a 1949 portrait of the Martinican poet Aimé Césaire, the portrait of Fidelin draws attention to what seems to be the only two portraits based on black models in his extensive body of work. This conceptualized portrait of Césaire, which he created to illustrate his friend's book of poems, I'm sorry, uh, uh, was subsequently featured on the poster for the first Congress of Black Writers and Artists organized in Paris in 1958. Notably, the notion of the global African presence celebrated in this Congress reflects the same historical forces that defined not only Césaire's life, but Fidelin's as well. Although outside the scope of today's presentation, pairing these two portraits opens up shared issues of creolite and the importance of the negritude movement in shifting perceptions of racial difference that merit further attention. Unraveling the layers of Picasso's femme assise and the story behind its creation has exposed larger concerns at the stake in the recovery of a woman of color at the heart of this attribution, shining a light on how issues of race, gender, representation, and difference have inflected the modernist project. 
As this elusive figure continues to emerge from the shadows through endeavors to put her life's account back into historical context, we gain a far richer sense of the stories of diverse black figures who were integral not only to the careers of the artists with whom they collaborated, but also with their very presence informed the culture of modernity itself. Thank you. As, as, as a brief footnote, um, I wanted to share a little something about the ongoing discovery or recovery of Fidelin's story. And even though she has lost the pages of history, she has become a, a figure of great intrigue. This is an eyeshadow palette by the NARS company, um, in which I actually was very uh, privileged to be consultant to. And they were very excited to be able to create and use her image. So we are looking at the way in which she is gaining in popular, as a popular figure even today, that her image continues to intrigue. So again, thank you. Thank you.